This is the Change Physician, episode 209. 209. 209. No, I don't like that. Sounds weird. (laughs) It was fine. Just leave it. Just leave it. All right. Just leave it. 209. 209. (laughs) Anyway, folks, this is episode 209 of the Change Physician podcast. Thank you for joining us today. I'm your host, Dr. Kevin Kukara, with my amaze balls. I haven't used that term enough lately. Mm -hmm. Amaze balls co host, Dr. Melissa Katie. Dr. Katie, how are you? Good. Just clearing my COVID throat. Clearing your COVID throat. So we've had an episode where we talked about our experiences with COVID and hopefully you guys have either had positive experiences as much as they can be. Um, and if you have or have not, go and listen to that because it can be can deal, derail your life rather substantially. Very quickly. Uh, very quickly. Um, anyway, but for this particular episode, so, so if you guys don't know, like Melissa and I sometimes will just sit here and talk and we've been talking for almost an hour. Um <laughs> And I'm always kind of wondering, like, maybe we should record those conversations, except for the fact, and maybe, I mean, maybe this is the reason that we should record them because there's, we say some things in those particular episodes that are, um, that can be quite controversial. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I stand by everything I say. So yes, they're controversial and I don't necessarily want to be a controversial guy, but um yeah. Anyway, but I think like you anything, challenge people's beliefs. So that's yeah. why it's so controversial. Well, it's controversial. And I guess there's the point of controversy for controversy sake, And they say, and there's a sense of controversy because we're, it's, it allows us to learn and grow, right. you know, and that's, a, that's kind of the point. Controversy can be good in that because if, if, if you are feeling reactive or someone has said something and you're feeling a rise and your heart rate goes up and your stomach starts to get kind of out of tune a little bit, that is not necessarily a bad thing. What it just tells you is your beliefs are getting pushed. Mm -hmm. And if your beliefs are getting pushed, obviously the number one thing that your brain is going to want to do is to reinforce that belief because it doesn't like it. Yeah. Uh, But with, with in this day and age, when there's so much information available, I I would really encourage people to be more of a curiosity mindset and saying, you know, instead of that can't be true. In fact, on my talks, I, this is like an introduction I always give in my talks now is that instead of ending things with a statement like, oh, Dr. Carl, you said that you're a complete and utter idiot, period, or Dr. Katie, I can't believe you said that. You're the stupidest doctor ever, period, is if you end it with a question mark, what that allows you to do is then to start kind of proceeding and massaging and actually be willing to kind of revise your beliefs. So instead it becomes Dr. Kukaro, you're the dumbest, stupidest doctor I've ever met in my life. Is that true? Peer, you know, question mark here or Dr. Katie, have you, I can't believe you said something so stupid. Is that really that stupid question mark? Then we can have, a, have this really meaningful discussion on things that are actual, that, that are meaningful to existence. You know, that's, the point of controversy in a lot of things, when, when we're afraid to be controversial, we're really becoming static in our growth in life. And I, I, one of the things about this day and age that we're in with polarization is I think we, 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 it doesn't allow us to grow. Mm-hmm. So I, this is something beyond what, as usual, what we were talking about, but, yeah. but, but what are your experiences when it comes to the beliefs and controversy and saying things or, or even the fear that you have about publishing things? Because we've been doing this for a long time, both together as well as independently on not on topics that are very difficult. Mm-hmm. So what are your opinions kind of regarding controversy and saying things in the interwebs and things? Well, I'm just going to put this out there. I tend to not. Um, you can ask my husband. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go out, go out on a limb and be vulnerable and say this, but I'm, I'm somebody that is, uh, my husband calls me a pacifist at times because I don't like controversy, not in the way that, um, unwilling to learn. So the, the, luckily for me, despite wanting to not have confrontation, I'm very curious. So I like to, um, I was just thinking about saying offering the 25th meaning the 25th letter of the alphabet, why? (laughs) So instead of pleading the fifth, I'm going to offer the 25th and (laughs) ask why. Um, So that that's probably enabled me to um, circumvent a very um, difficult conversation because I, I, I think I genuinely seem curious to people when I, if I don't agree or I'm trying to understand so, so, so when just to kind of to uh, to clarify here, you're talking if you're in a in a conversation with an individual, you 
um, is this regarding something they say, and then you say why, or is this something that they, they're saying, is that true, Dr. K like, or something that you say, and then they find in in incompatible with their belief system? It's both. Um, okay. I would say that if I, if someone's coming to me for like uh, pain concerns or something, sometimes I just have to refrain and just be quiet because I feel so strongly about their capacity to help themselves, but that's not the way that they believe things need to be done. Things need to be done passively to them. Um, I can get, I, I'm not like a total jerk, but it, I, it, my worst case scenario, I would say I can be condescending, but not because I'm wanting to be unhelpful. I really want to help people understand that they can change their situation or have a better, maybe a better approach in my view based on science and my own opinion and biases. So um, that's an, an example. But um, I would say that uh, if I know that someone, I don't know, loves a particular political figure. <laughs> I might be like, so why do you think uh, this person's so great? You know, like kind of curious, like how they could get to that belief of, you know, what I think is absolutely ridiculous, you know? So I don't know if that helped answer what you're asking. Uh, well, a little bit. I, I, I think um, part, part of it is if we're talking about publication, Right. So if we're, we're doing a podcast, we're doing this podcast here and we've, and we've had discussions off air and we've had some pretty deep discussions off air. And this re basically occurs weekly every time we get together. And a lot of times we, well, most of the time we say we don't record them and we don't publish them. Yeah. Despite the fact that there are sometimes extraordinarily, I think, valuable in discourse, this discourse is the, is a, is a much better word in those because we'll be working back and forth in this dialogue. The scary thing is though, is um, because of the controversy involved, I'll, I'll tell you from my point, it becomes scary. I don't want to publish them because someone oh, out yeah. there is going to grab them and someone's going to pull one line out I'm and, smear it on you. And, and they'll smear. And it's like, I don't have a lot to smear. It's not like I'm some public figure or running for Congress yeah. or, or anything else. But when you have people attack you, which I have had done, and have you had people publish things online about you, which I have had done again, not, not in comparison to like real public figures, but enough, it, it really freaking hurts. Yeah. And it is scary. And I've been threatened before. Yeah. Um, but in the same token, if, if we're not willing to publish truth or at least fact, and then have a discussion about that, I kind of wonder where we're going as a society yeah because then people are being misled well because all we're willing to do is have discussions on things that reinforce the beliefs that we already have mm -hmm. that's not growth yeah so um i like i like what you're talking about why i think why is a great question that because you can if if you're feeling confronted by something that's con you know that's activating your belief protective system your bps i'm just going to say that yeah. Uh, the, the way to respond then is not with rigidity, but really with kind of flexibility and being curious. And so I could see that where someone says something, I don't necessarily ag agree with it. I can respond then by saying, well, how can that be true? Or why is that true? Or what are you using to build this, this, the statement from versus saying that can't be true. You're a liar. Um, I don't believe all the data on there because it, because it's just, I don't care what all those scientists say it is simply not true. Um, but then on the flip side, then being the publisher, which is, which is kind of where my question was coming from when you're the publisher of information, or you're the one making the statement in front, and now you have the horde or mob or audience in front of you yeah. being able to respond in such a way where you also can be a little bit more flexible and rather than rigid and, and say, well, well, what are you basing that on? Or why, why would you say that such a, such a thing or you know, that kind of curiosity? I think there is some, I think it's hard. I think all of it's hard, oh, but yeah. I think that can be a very advantageous way because if you're responding in curiosity and it is not condescending curiosity, but, but actually meaningful curiosity, well, trying to understand where they're coming from, 
that I think it could be very potent. I just think in this day and age with the internet, it's incredibly difficult to have that kind of dialogue anymore. Yeah. Well, I would, I would say this is applicable to many situations of like a physician and a patient um, because they're coming in with their preconceived notions based on what they were looking and researching on the internet. Um, but if you, something you made me think about earlier is that when you're confronted with this potential conflict or this, um, this drastic contrast in beliefs, um, regardless of how much it's based on any science or not, is that the more, the more headstrong in the sense of being stubborn in the sense of not opening up curiosity. If, if one person's not opening up a curiosity, highly unlikely, and, and if the other person's already kind of rigid, for them to maybe open up in curiosity or be open to potentially some of the things that, you know, maybe get opened up by the curiosity part. Mm -hmm. So I see a lot in society where it seems like the rigidity, it, it, it stays, it, it conforms to whatever this hard belief that is in, ingrained even harder when, when communities online or offline are, are kind of like reinforcing these beliefs. And then so what happens when there's no curiosity at all. There's, there's like no compassion and there's um, sometimes the beginning of violence. So it just, I know this is not, not where we were going to go originally, but I think there's, there's, it's really important for us as physicians um, to lend, uh, even if you're limited on time, to lend a, an ear and, and have some curiosity, because if you want to have any chance in helping to change people, and yes, it's hard in practice to do this, um, whether it's medical practice or just human practice in general, um, if you if you don't try to understand where they're at and where they're coming from, there's no way in hell you're going to help them change maybe some things that are not helping them. Um, so, uh, I don't know, what do you think about that? No, I, I would agree. I also um, all, all of this is is requiring engagement on such a level that is, uh, that it's hard. Like it's hard to sustain. You know, I, I kind of, um, way back, way back when in college, I took a, a class on uh, some kind of, I forgot it was like health communications or whatever. And the whole class revolved around reflective listening. And I think this actually must've been pre-motivational interviewing. Cause I'm sure if it was out, we would have, we would have talked about it and reflective listening being a part of what's used in motivational interviewing now. And reflective listen, listening is all about like just being very open and, and being uh, asking open-ended questions and reflecting back what they say in such a way that they're, that they're talking, that the person is actually talking more and more and more. And, and it can lead to some really powerful, dis, well, listening moments, because you're really, really all about listening and learning from the other person, but it was freaking exhausting. Yeah. And, and that's the part that, that we we almost in some, such, some ways, when it comes to that doctor-patient relationship in the day-to-day -day clinic, we, we want to have every single encounter be as engaged as we, and present as we possibly can be. Yeah. But, but how do you do that <laughs> when, when you're seeing more and more patients every day? If, you have like, if you're seeing 20 plus patients a day, that by itself, I'm not exactly sure if it's possible. Um, it's certainly extraordinarily difficult and draining. If you're seeing 30 plus patients a day or more, there's no way. I, I, I just simply do not see how you can be so engaged unless you've been so practicing it, it comes effortlessly to you because that behavior is so engaged, in which case maybe it does. But because that engaged listening and being curious and having this dialogue around people's belief patterns or, and this is so important to medicine because people come in saying they want something because it's been advertised on TV or something that's told them yeah. that is simply not in line with what the evidence and data says. And I, and the default is generally just to go through with it because that's easier than actually having these meaningful dialogues and, and people, you know, there's all these you know, uh, uh, medical journals that oh, they're doing this and the, people are prescribing uh, antibiotics when it's a viral infection. And, and it's like, yeah, they shouldn't be, but it gets exhausting trying to do the right thing all the time. 
and particularly when people are so un, people are so you know these belief patterns are so fixed. I guess this is a long way to say is this is such a big deal, effective yeah. communication, and is so important in medicine. But if you can't do it all the time, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt because it's so exhausting. You simply you, you there is no human that can sustain the this degree of curiosity and engagement and passion. active listening and passion all the time you can't do it yeah yeah and then it's the um the reinforcement at times because it's so hard to stay engaged in that capacity uh the reinforcement is that the patient's getting what they want when that's maybe not what they need or what they should be getting but yet they're happier with the physician because they're getting what they think they need like it's this crazy loop it's, it's a horrible loop. Like I, there was a guy who got, I think he lost his medical license, a neurosurgeon in Oregon who was, um, horrendous. They were not as bad as the guy in Texas that was killing all the doctor death or whatever. Oh God! But this guy was over operating on people. Like we're talking operations after operations doing an, you know, a one cervical ACDF. And then six months later doing another one or extending, I mean, like absolutely absurd. And, uh, and when I was a little bit more, um, masochistic, masochistic, really kind of killing myself. I, I would get these articles and I would go and then I would like read the comments and the comments, man. Oh, Dr. So-and-so, so great. And doctor, I can't believe that this is a witch hunt for Dr. So-and-so and so. And he did my first five fusions and blah, blah, blah. He's the only person who listened to me. And I'm like, and he just, he's, he's crippling you. I mean, that, that's a, that's, <laughs> I don't yeah. know. I guess, you know so kind of, Taking it, taking it, like I said, taking it back. We start like we're, we have these conversations where 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 we are. I'm going to be kind of frank, scared to publish them because they're so controversial. And then we come, we've moved it into sort of these medical situations where where it becomes difficult to to stay in these engaged loops. But then knowing, and I, for whether you're you're the physician or the patient or or however you work is the fact of the matter if you are only looking for people to confirm what you already think is true you're gonna lead yourself into a pit basically no matter what yeah. um and and i guess in, and again someone i think we get we're getting so and this is left this is both left and right in a lot of ways is the is the fact that people are getting attacked for making for stating a an opinion and people are trying to get to, to destroy people's lives. What kind of society are we building? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Cause it becomes very stale and then it becomes just the self-reinforcing pattern where there is no, no real growth and there is no real learning. And from a patient standpoint, patient physician relations standpoint, there's real harms associated with this. Yeah. You know, if we're not, if you're not willing to listen to your doctor, then you probably shouldn't even be going to your doctor find a way to order whatever it is that you want online. There's places that do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Isn't that the weird complexity of it though? It's like, um, you know, we, we talk about there's, there are some bad physicians out there. I mean, they're human beings that are in the role of a physician that were intelligent enough to get through all the training and the rigors of everything you have to do to, to just get licensed and, and maintain things or whatever. Um, is that you've got you've got those people, but it's it's like you don't want you you want to warn patients, you want to educate them, flip the script, so to speak, help them understand that these beliefs that are very much indoctrinated within the system may not be serving them. It's like in in two you're trying to like warn them in a way or just try to educate them. That's probably a nice way of saying it. Mm -hmm. But yet you don't want them to completely not trust the, the people in it. And it's like navigating that for patients to help them understand we're challenging your beliefs because of we've recognized through the experience and understanding of, of science and what it's showing us. Maybe we have not been doing it the best way. Like we, we want them to know that we're just trying to challenge them and under, to make better choices for their health. But we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater kind of thing. Like it, it's just really hard to, for them, like, who do they trust? You know, when it comes to 
well, these are my beliefs. A lot of people reinforce it. You're making me challenge my beliefs and they seem contradictory. So who do I believe? You know, that, that just seems really, really difficult from someone who's not in the medical field. To, and it comes down to sometimes it's who they like. And unfortunately, the physician you like may not be what's best for you. Yeah, well, there's a lot of that that yeah. who you like and and um and there is some studies based on patient satisfaction and these are predominantly inpatient studies that i'm aware of and the one that basically show the more satisfied you were or the happier you were with your care the worse outcomes that were associated with that yeah. so um i i, I kind of recommend people if you're satisfied with everything that your doctor tells you then you probably something's wrong because then you're just, they're just basically telling you what you want to hear and, and, and presenting with, see, this is the, if you feel bad and you present to your doctor and you're expecting to feel better and you want a fix, but there are very few things that we can actually fix in medicine. If it's one of those things, then yes, there's a therapy for it. If it's one of the many other things that aren't, and you can still feel crappy, the, the answer isn't more of those things that we do that don't make you better, in which case makes you worse. But we live in the society where people think that they're going to get the fix and it becomes easier in such a way to do, to, to simply to prescribe the fix, whether it's, you know, I call it, you know, look, cut, lick, cut, poke, and drug. So we'll order the tests when they're not warranted, imaging, x-rays, MRIs, lab work, or whatever. We cut you or re recommend you to a surgery, even if it's not re recommended, but people will feel better because, oh, there's a surgeon's going to do something, poke you, we do an injection with whether or not it's appropriate or not, or drug you, we prescribe a medication, even though that may not necessarily be the right situation for you. But people, you know, those are the four things that we can do as physicians. People expect you to do something. And then the default then becomes because we don't want to have these challenging interactions or there is a, I don't want to say that. We don't, it's not that we don't want to have these challenging interactions. We get exhausted by trying to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. We default to those behaviors. On the flip side, there are some doctors that I've met, like you kind of introduced this earlier. There are doctors doing things that we do a really crappy job of policing them. Are these bad humans? Probably not. Are they bad doctors? Yes. And I always kind of move back to that idea of the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I have met people that we can almost say they are overabundance on the empathy score and they do things not because they're the right thing to do, but they, because they feel they have to do something for the patient yeah. and, and their need to do something, even if it's inappropriate, overwhelmed what their medical judgment should be on what's appropriate or not. And, and again, so I've kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of hemming and hawing here on both ways, but there are certain things that we would, you know, you, you're exhausted and you simply do, but there are people who aren't exhausted that simply do and do and do and do like, I, I don't, I, I haven't seen this story on Dr. Death, or I don't know the neurosurgeon in, in, in Oregon, who was, who did all these operations. And I am pretty sure he lost his license. Um, but there are very few people that identify themselves as evil, right? Most people believe they're a good person on the inside. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think a lot of this behavior is driven by people thinking that they're doing the right thing, or I should say they're doing the, doing the thing that they believe is the right thing to do in this situation, even though that they know basically all the evidence says otherwise. So they're, they're doing anecdotal practice versus evidence-based practice. And they, and, and they can't, having someone dissatisfied to them hurts more than doing the wrong thing on somebody and having a satisfied person come out of it. Hmm. And it, it, it's, um, and I still, this, I think this keeps reflecting back to this idea though, that if, if we're not willing to have converse, meaningful conversations that challenge underlying beliefs, not, and we're not trying to be jerks about any of this stuff, but you know, having those conversations and as a receiver and involved in that, being able to receive this information that challenges your confirm your, your biases and your internal beliefs that we, if we can't do that in a respectful way, um, I think it's very harmful to society. Certainly in the medical system is, and we have abundance yeah. of information on how that harms people. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, I just brought up another topic. Um, I'll just refrain from, but, um, 
you know, I do think, I mean, you said most people are not bad humans, but I, there are a couple bad humans that I think we have to like Dr. Death does. Uh, I don't know that person personally, um, but from the data that I've heard and understood to be true, um, you, there's always going to be a bad person occasionally, but I would, I would agree with you that most people are good people or feel like they're good people that are making poor choices or feel like they're better um, better off just doing what the patient wants versus, you know, what really the patient needs or doesn't need. So, yeah. Well, and you already remember the judgment of bad becomes, is it perception upon it another is. person, right? I, guess, I, mean, that's, I think that's the point is I, I don't think there's a lot of people who are, who are like self-identifying themselves as I'm an evil person, which is kind of the, like the funny thing. Yeah. But I mean, it's I, like your, your neighbor, your next door neighbor is a serial murderer. Oh, they're so nice. And they've always been like giving me Christmas gifts and but yet he's, you know, you know, got a, a family that apparently is safe, but doing crazy things to other people. Like, well, you know, like at what point do you qualify them as evil or evil. bad? Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's, that, that's another discussion for yeah. you know, a deep discussion. They put on this facade and everyone thinks they're great. And there's multiple angles to people that yeah. At what, yeah. Anyway, they, they can be tainted. So I guess long and short of this, since we've been talking about this for a while, is um, I'm going to try to summarize this. Open this discussion on this idea of having deep conversations that we're afraid to publish because of the controversy that may be engenerated. Understanding that when it comes to something controversial, unless you're and there, are, unfortunately, people who try to do this, we don't. We're not trying to be controversial. We're, we're trying to have meaningful conversations. And any if if you are having that as a society, we, we need to be willing to at least to listen to, in, to, to evidence or information that disconfirms the beliefs that we have in order to grow. Moving on to a more personal level, those in, individual patient physician interactions, then um, it's exhausting, very exhausting to have an engaged conversation on a deep level when you don't necessarily agree and you're trying to understand what somebody's saying and then and then maintaining to what would be quote unquote the appropriate therapy that can that's exhausting so we understand that um and then finally kind of ending with the fact that there are people though uh and this is not what you want whether in healthcare or in life that will simply stay, tell you what you want to hear yeah. and they'll tell you what you want to hear and you may feel better hearing it but overall you'll do worse because it's kind of leading you down that, that road to, well, in, in medical, this is a bad things. I mean, <laughs> if, if you've had 15 spinal fusions, which is, which has happened um, because people keep telling you that you need an operation versus an operation versus an operation again, I, I can pretty much guarantee you're worse at the end of that than you were when you started. Yeah. Um, and then, and there's other ones that are, that are similar in different types of fields. So I'm not just picking on spine surgery, but that's an easy yeah. one to pick on. Yeah, I think I think uh, I essentially see this whole conversation about uh, confronting challenging beliefs. I mean, at every level, from a societal to um, you know medical personal level. There, I, I think this is this is like timely, really, for everything that's going on in our country right now, um, because. I feel like there's a lot of people, not even in the medical field, that talk about, you know, the challenges with beliefs and 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 interacting, even with friends that mm -hmm. maybe they don't talk to anymore. I, I think there's there's a lot of relevance to um, having a little more curiosity, um, and uh, um, but I think there is a challenge when people are not willing to listen to evidence or understand what facts or evidence is <laughs> so i think that can make it even harder and as a physician i think you have to um help present that information to patients which can you know maybe you can have an easy way to share that because <laughs> uh that would take up more time during a conversation obviously but uh um i'm actually kind of glad our conversation went in this direction because i think it's really relevant um to everyone yeah i, I, I guess takeaways takeaways for us i'm like wondering maybe, well, maybe we should again, not trying to be controversial, but, and I think we have stepped into it now that this has been two years now that we've been a little bit more, um, we, we just need 
all of our discussions are honest, but maybe sometimes we need to, to have more discussions about important things that potentially people aren't going to agree with. Yeah. Uh, because there's a lot of things that people think are true that are simply not true. And, and it's, it would be something useful to talk about. Yeah. Maybe it could be helpful for them to share with their patients for certain. Yeah. Things. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Well, um, you want to take us out or you want me to take us out? I think you should take us out on this one. Well, I think, uh, Kevin, I think you pointed out some good points from our conversation. So I won't, you know, repeat those again. Um, but for those of you listening, if you don't know what the change physician is all about, you can go to the and join the community, whether you're a physician or a physician ally, we'd love to see you there. Of course, we're on Instagram and YouTube and all those good things. Um, and check out our next episodes as well. And until next time, I'm Melissa Kitty, the challenge doctor with Dr. Kevin Kakara. We'll see you next time. Bye. Stay well, folks.